we know that the networking backbone for AI infrastructure is evolving at this breakneck speed. As the GPU clusters scale from thousands to hundreds of thousands of nodes, and every link on the path needs to be upgraded. The switches, the optics, the NICs, they all need to deliver higher throughput, lower latency, and smarter congestion control. Ethernet, which has been considered a general purpose interconnect, is rapidly becoming the preferred fabric for AI workloads, driven by programmability, telemetry, and open ecosystem innovations. So this week, Broadcom is taking another step forward with the launch of Thor Ultra. It's the industry's first 800 gig Ethernet NIC, and it's specifically designed for AI scale data centers. So it's my pleasure today to dig in deeper to this launch with Hassan Siraj from Broadcom. So welcome, Hassan. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be here once again. So first, let's set the stage. Why is there this need to, to move faster? What kinds of workloads are we talking about? Where does 800 gig come into play? Absolutely, Jim. AI is fundamentally a very different workload from the traditional workloads on which the clouds have been built. You know, we have talked about the TCPI traffic. These are hundreds and thousands of flows. They distribute each other very well right across the network. But AI, you have a lot fewer flows they are much bigger, we call them elephant flows. And um, <clears throat> when you have, and you have very few of them, right? when you're going through the machine learning process. So in order to get the best network performance, you need to be able to do a few things. You need to have a network which is the highest performance from a bandwidth perspective. And this is why this is the, uh, the world's first 800 gig NIC. The other things which are very important is how do you do the right load balancing? Right? You, there are multiple parts in the network that you can go through. You want to make sure you optimize it on that front. The third thing is how do you do the right congestion control? You'll have a lot of congested paths in the network. So the right congestion control mechanism is extremely important. Uh, the fourth important tenant in this case is how do you do the right failover? Right? You know, if you're failing in certain situations, you don't want to go back to checkpointed states and delay the job completion time. So in order to get the best performance, these four things, which is the highest performance, right load balancing, right congestion control, and recovery from failures is very important. Meta talked about this three years ago, which was one of the motivations right, that we had, which is when they were trying to train these recommendation workloads, network was taking about 57% of the time. So imagine you have spent a couple of billion dollars in building an infrastructure and 57% of the time that infrastructure is consumed and the traffic is stuck in the network itself. Um, and these are the three or four problems that needed to be solved to get the right performance out of the network. Okay. It seems that there's a lot of technologies that are evolving then at the same time. Um, in these workloads that you were mentioning, we of course start to think of Rocky, you know, how do you move those big memory blocks for AI? And then there's the transport, the move towards ultra ethernet. So how are those coming to play with this new Nick. Yeah, so RDMA is kind of the fundamental protocol that is used for high-performance computing and um, AI networks. And when you're doing RDMA over Ethernet, that's called Rocky or um, RDMA over Converged Ethernet. And one of the things that was very important, right, that's where the Ultra Ethernet Consortium was formed about three years ago, was how do you do modernize RDMA? Because it had certain limitations, especially when we knew that we were going to go at very large-scale deployments go to hundreds of thousands to million GPU clusters. And the first thing was that RDMA did not support multipathing. The second thing is it did, could not do out-of-order placement. RDMA as a protocol expected packets to arrive in order, otherwise the packets got dropped. Uh, the third thing was it had a very old mechanism for retransmits, which was go back in which is a packet which is um, not received is not only is that packet transmitted by the sender, but every single packet after that is also transmitted. The congestion control schemes that were there, they were very hard to tune. And all of this made it very difficult to build a very large scale cluster. And those were a few things, limitations in RDMA that the UEC set out to see how do we modernize this. and. Those are some of the features, the capabilities that we have introduced in this NIC. So it's programmability then in order to get these kind of uh, capabilities. So absolutely, programmability is a key aspect. Programmability is really needed in terms of what kind of congestion control schema that you want to use in the network. There is preference sometimes for a receiver-based congestion control in which the sender cannot send any traffic till you have enough 
credits. There is also uh, for certain customers, there is a preference to do what we call a sender based congestion control mechanism in which you calculate the round trip time between the sender and the receiver. And based on that, you are transmitting. So we have a programmable pipeline in this, um, uh, in this chip which gives the flexibility to not only implement receiver-based congestion control, but sender-based congestion control. But it's also flexible enough that down the road, if a new scheme comes up or modifications are needed in a spec, uh, we can accommodate that without spinning the chip. Okay. All right. Great. So let, let, let's turn the discussion a little bit towards the performance and the scalability aspects. These are really big clusters, right, that uh, they're, they're building and latency is more important than ever. So how are you making progress in that area? So we have been briefing you on some of the developments over the last three to four months, right? And we talked about Tomahawk 6, for example. Right? Tomahawk 6 allows you to build a 128,000 GPU cluster in a true tier topology. And that is extremely important because there is nothing else that can allow you to build at this scale in two tiers. You have to go to three tiers. And the difference between the two is that, you, you, of course, when you are in two hops, it's a lot less complicated network, right? Load balancing is, is easier. Congestion control is easier. You are using a lot less power. You are using a lot less optics. You are reducing the number of hops in the network. And um, this NIC is what will um, connect to a Tomahawk 6, right? To build these large 128,000 to bring this whole thing come together. Okay. So Thor Ultra is being introduced at the opening of the OCP Summit 2025. There's been a lot of talk, of course, in the industry about is the whole uh, architecture becoming consolidated by just one player or maybe two players. But I, I think with this, Nick, you were also emphasizing any XPU, a, any switch, any server. T talk to us about ecosystem and openness and why that's important for this product line. Oh, absolutely. And you know, at Broadcom, when we are building this entire portfolio for AI, openness is a key, key consideration for us. And we believe that anybody who is building these large AI clusters should have the flexibility in terms of what they want to use on the network side. And in line with uh, that um, motivation, Thor Ultra, it will connect to any switch. This switch can be from Cisco, from Marvel, from NVIDIA. Uh, it connects to any XPU, which means it can be NVIDIA XPU, it can be AMD, it can be any of the other players, or it could be a custom accelerator. Um, that is built by a hyperscaler themselves. Um, and of course, there is no limitation in terms of optics. Um, we have um, uh, this coming with in 100 gig and 200 gig uh, series form factors, and we will support both the 100 gig and the 200 gig system uh, ecosystem, right, from an optics perspective. So the main, the other main point is if you connect this to any of the switches, none of the features will get disabled. None of the features will behave in a more mediocre manner, right? Um, to put it bluntly, everything will function right for every switch or any XPU the way it functions when it's connected to uh, a Broadcom device. Finally, be before we wrap up, a question that probably should always be asked towards the beginning, and that's uh, you know security, security first. And uh, I understand that you're introducing some line encryption capabilities here as well. So could you talk to us a little bit about that and does it impact latency? Uh, yes, no, absolutely. Typically when the backend networks, and you know, this is a NIC that has been built ground up for backend, right? For AI backend clusters. It's really all of this infrastructure on uh, and security requirements are not as stringent, but as more and more customers look towards how they're building sovereign clouds, it is now becoming a more top of mind item. And this is why we have support for PSP encryption, line rate encryption and decryption. And it's line rate and there is no performance hit, right? So you can turn on this functionality and nothing else, the performance of any other feature is impacted as you go through this. In addition, there are other security capabilities. For example, we have support for secure boot on this chip. And we can also do uh, device authentication in the sense that, you know, this is a NIC is one more item that goes in a server, right? So there is mechanisms in place where it can connect to the host and we ensure that the right firmware and the right NIC, there's nothing that tampers uh, tampered with that goes in the network. Excellent. And finally, Hassan, could you put all of this in some context? It's been a very busy season for Broadcom with upgrades, I think, across the whole networking uh, switching lines from the Tomahawk 6 and Jericho 4, 
Could you put, provide a little bit of context about how all these pieces are coming together for Broadcom? Yeah, Jim, absolutely. Um, when we are looking at deploying these very large clusters, we look at scale um, at different levels, right? We look at scale at the level of scale up. This is uh, how you are building a rack. Um, and that scale today is, you know, around 100 XPUs moving to maybe 200 to 500 XPUs in the next three years. You know, our Tomahawk 6 and the Tomahawk Ultra right, that we have released really are catering to that environment. The next is how you take this rack, connect a lot of them together and build a scale out network. And this can be hundreds of thousands of XPUs in a data center. And this is where Tomahawk 6 and our Jericho 4 portfolio comes into play. And last but not least, uh, I think what's becoming increasingly important is these, if it's a 10 megawatt data center, you can maximum fit in 5,000 or 6,000 XPUs. So what if you need to go beyond this? This is how do you go across data centers? And this is where our Jericho portfolio with deep buffers, line net encryption comes into play. And then how do you connect into the network? We have this new scale out 800 gig NIC, and we also contributed the scale up ethernet IP or to OCP uh, or a scale up ethernet specification to OCP that gives people recommendation if they're building an XPU, how do, how do you put in a, an ethernet interface in there? So with this portfolio, we believe that Broadcom is well positioned to serve the industry to build the largest clusters as they look to move beyond 100,000, 150,000 to build clusters, which are half a million or even a million XPUs. It is well positioned to serve that customer base. Thank you, Hassan. It's really fascinating how, how quickly this industry is moving forward and what a race we're in. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.